Thursday, March 17th. We're going to do a lesson on um, corrective patterns in the Elliott, uh, Elliott Wave. So you have in the settings and files room, I'll post it again, you have, uh, where is it? You have this little cheat sheet kind of a thing for the Elliott Wave basic rules, which is right here, basics of Elliott Wave principle. I'll post that again. And I'll put it in the settings and files room again. And we'll go over some of the corrective patterns now. Okay, let's look at the corrections. All right, this is your typical zigzag where the A wave will come down in five waves, the B would be three, and the C would be five waves as well. So you have five, three, five. You essentially have three types of corrections. We'll go into the details of the variations between uh, two of them. But you have either a five, three, five, or you have a three, three, five, which would be uh, one of the types of the flats, the flat corrections. We'll go over those. And then you have a three, 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 three. Five waves, three waves each, which would be a triangle. <clears throat> okay, so those are the three main types of corrections. And then you have variations of each of those. And let's go into those. So these are the motive waves. These are the big extended waves where you know, the, the large waves are not overlapping. Those are your impulsive waves. And after the impulse, then you have the corrections. And those are the types of waves that we try to find the ends of. There's the end of the corrective patterns after the impulsive waves. We'll get into the truncation at another point. This would be one of the reversal patterns, one of the ending diagonals. It's a a really good high probability reversal pattern. You don't see those all that often, but when you do, they, they typically work out higher probability. So here you have the zigzag, 535. Five. You have the flat, 335. Three, and like I said, the triangle, 33333. Three, 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 three. Okay, so like it's telling you here, you have three types, a single, a double and a triple. I don't see triple zigzags very often at all, but you will see double zigzags quite often. So then you get into um, complex corrections where you can have kind of an extended correction that is usually three or four times longer in time than the motive wave or the impulse into that correction. And those are the ones where people get chopped up you have, you know, kind of range bound back and forth, back and forth. And you can really get chopped up in, in those complex corrections. But if you're at least trading from the market geometry areas, you'll typically be up at least temporarily in the trade. Uh, and you can typically, you know, typically get out at break even or, um, even with several ticks. So. The way that we're trading, you, you'll typically not have very large losers, even if you do go into a complex correction. The only time you take a full stop is if you're just completely wrong, like I was this morning in, uh, in the ES. And then, of course, you have combinations, like I was just saying, where you can have, you know, a, a zigzag, and then the next wave would be a flat, and then another zigzag or something like that. Okay, so we'll try to find some examples of these. This is your zigzag. You come down in five, up in three. All right, hang on a second. I didn't put that in the room. Okay, now it's in the settings and files room as well. And I didn't post it. Okay, now it's in the day trading, the ES and CL hip chat room as well. So if you don't have that already, 
And then go ahead and download it now and you can kind of follow along or just follow along with me now and then we'll find a bunch of examples of these over the next 45 minutes or so. Okay, this is a double zigzag. So this is two zigzags put together, which is why we label that W, X, Y. Because you're coming down in a zigzag, A, B, C, and then you go up in a big three, and then you come down in one more zigzag. So this is a complex correction. It's a double zigzag. Two zigzags together, and then this is the flat and you have a couple of variations of this. This is a, a double top, double bottom flat. Those aren't as common. I think the most common one that I see is typically um, a lower B and a lower C. And then next to that would be the expanded flat, which is what we've seen, I think, twice. Maybe that's a 20 minute chart. I'll show you some examples of this. We have a lot of examples of that where you come down in three, and then you go up in three more, taking out this previous high here. This high. And then you come down in five to take out that low. And this is the one that really messes people up. This is why you need to get as familiar with this expanded flat as possible. It'll save you a lot of uh, misdirection in the market and hopefully a lot of bad trades so coming down in five waves when people first start out with Elliott Wave they think okay well it's gonna retrace and I'll short it right here well it does that and then you may get a little retracement back down and you think you're in the money and then it goes off to new highs <clears throat> that's because you've just finished an expanded flat. Okay, so this is the one you have to watch out for. Then you get into the triangles, which you don't see all that often. I'll show you the trade that we took on day before yesterday, so it was Tuesday, which I kind of got in at uh, the D wave here. So your typical triangle will be a symmetrical triangle. Right, this is the one you probably see most often. You've got the starting point here, which we would label that as just a zero. And then you've got A, which is down in three, B back up, which is up in three, C down in three, and then you have this kind of converging pattern where you have down sloping trend line and an up sloping trend line trend line and then your little tiny e wave and then it usually will explode out of that and break above this high and the move out of that is always either a fifth wave now it could be the start of a fifth wave and then just extend and keep going but it's always going to be a fifth wave or a c wave your triangle can only be a wave four or a B wave or an X wave which is kind of like a B wave so it's either a, a B an X or a fourth wave and I'll show you some examples of that okay then you have uh, this expanded expanding I'm not gonna go into that I never see those uh, but this one you will see where Hang on a second, where's the other one? This is just where the B wave comes up and makes a double top. Your B and your D, so you have kind of like a triple top. And then you have an ascending trend line. I can't say that I see that that often. But the one that you will see more often will be this one right here. And that is where the B wave takes out the starting point. Okay, and then you have your down sloping trend line from B to D, and then A to E, you have an up sloping trend line. 
Okay, you will see this one. And this is obviously your, your bull and your bear. And then you have the fifth wave up, or the fifth wave down, or the C wave up, or the C wave down. Or the, the Y. Right? If you're in a double zigzag or something. Or a double flat. And then you can get combinations of these where you have the complex correction. So here you have a flat, right? You've got three down, three up, five down. That's a flat. And then you go up in three, which is typically a zigzag. And then you come down in five, which is three down, three up, three down, three up, three down. And that's the end of your Y. Okay, sorry. So it can be an X, a Y, a B, or a fourth wave. Right? It could also be the end of a complex correction. But it's always going to be the wave before the last wave, your triangle, unless it's in the, uh, the X position or the B position. I'm oh, sorry, unless it's in the X position. No, but yeah, even then it's still the wave before the last one. So anytime you see a triangle, you typically will have kind of an explosive move out of that into an ending pattern. Okay, so always think of your triangle as being the wave before the last wave, basically. And when you get into these, you don't see them that often, but when you do get into them, you typically will go immediately in your favor, and uh, the trade will typically not go against you very much at all. So Virgil is asking, is this a triangle forming on the ES at this time? Let's see. Could be. Let's look at the one minute. It could be a tiny little triangle. You have three down. Three up. Three down. Mm. Yeah, you could count this as three, I guess. It's just such a, a very small move. I mean, this is a one minute chart, so. If we come down just a little bit more, then yes, you can have the end of a triangle right here. And you could go up in the final wave now. I mean, you know, maybe this is a, inside of this, maybe this is a tiny little three wave pattern. You know, I mean, this is, you, you've only got two or three ticks here. So not a lot of room uh, to count this correctly, but if it goes from here, yeah, that could be a triangle, or it could come down a little bit further and then go from here. Now the best example of a triangle I think we have in the past couple of days is that trade on, um, on Tuesday. Let me see here. Okay, let's look at this five minute chart of the ES. Now the thing is, you have to be careful about how you count it because I think I'm potentially counting this as a triangle when in fact we have, let's do this. I'm gonna look at this on the three. We'll look at it on the one minute so that we have a kind of a, a larger view. which is right there, yeah. Okay, now. So I'm counting this as a triangle when in fact it may be that this would be one up and two down, okay? I was counting this as A down, B up, 
C down, D, and then E. So this would be your A. B, C, D, and then E. And you can see the lines, the trend lines are converging. The only problem with this is that this is a double bottom. Okay, so this isn't really the perfect one like I was thinking it was. And this is more potentially a flat where we have three down, three up, and then five down. And this could potentially be, instead of a D, this could be one. So you have to be careful when you're trying to you know, figure this out in real time. Either way, you know you have another wave to go up. Okay, it may not be the last wave up because we may have, you know, counted this wrong. I was thinking that this is, you know, potentially one or A, sorry, B and then C. That's why I got out so early at 2005. I got out right. See, I got in right here. After this churn bar, it went one, two, three ticks against me. And then it went up. I tightened my stop up a little bit. It came to within one tick of my stop and then turned up right here on increasing volume to start off the next move to new highs. And then I think I got out at the upper median line here on the shift. Maybe it wasn't a shift, let's see. And for the most part, except within your complex corrections, for the most part, you're going, well, this isn't tracing out within a, uh, my channel anyway, let's see. For the most part, your corrective patterns will trace out within a channel. Okay? So that's why you're using the market geometry to find the end of the corrective pattern because it will typically run within a channel. Okay, and this obviously wasn't a correction. This turned into an impulsive move after we got the report yesterday. And, uh, went up to new highs. So let's see if we can find some more examples over the past few days of these different types of corrections. Here you have what looks to be a zigzag. Or a flat. It's really, you know, it's kind of hard to count on a one minute chart, which is why we're going to move to some larger charts here in a moment. But here you have, let's just call it a zigzag for now. Let's, let's just say this is five down, three up, and then five down. All right. That's your perfect little A. C. And you will typically trace out within your market geometry, your channel. Okay, here we only came down to the median line. We didn't quite come to the channel line, the auto line. Okay but you're still within the correction. So either you're going to make it down to the median line and then turn or um, all the way down to the channel line. Now, okay, just to say this quickly, 
In the ES, you have a climax bar followed by an extreme turn bar. So that's looking like a potential high. The only thing is, like I said, it's been grinding up slowly all day long. So I'm not saying go short here. I'm just saying this is a potential high right now in the ES. Maybe it comes up and tags uh, the trend line where the, the median line is intersecting the trend line up here at 2027, 20, 2028. And then of course we have a major area at 2032 to 2035. So and you've reversed up off of that lower median line here. <clears throat> so it may go a little bit further, but you have a lot of volume coming in there now in the three minute. Okay, so let's just take a picture of that. All right. Now then, let's go to I think it was crude. where we have this expanded flat on the 20 minute chart. And you may be able to count this a couple of different ways, but either this is the end of the third wave. So here we have one up and I'm not using the proper annotation. I'm not worried about it. I'm just trying to give you the basic idea here. So one up, two down, and then wave three has five waves. Let's just, for the sake of uh, explanation and example, let's call this the end of wave three. And then this would be the end of wave four. And then five is coming up into a high. Okay. So if this is the end of wave three, what do we have here for wave four? What's the name of that? We're coming up above this high. And we're coming down below this low. So here we're coming down in three waves, up in three, and then down in five. What's that called? Expanded flat, right. Okay, so you'll see that pretty often. Just about every day you'll see one of these in one of the markets. And this is the one that screws people up, like I was saying, because you're coming down in five waves and then people will tend to try to get in uh, as it pulls back, thinking that this is the end of a correction. And then it maybe, you know, comes down a little bit and then it turns against you and stops you out. So let me take a picture of this and then we'll zoom in on it. And you will get good at this eventually. You just have to practice. It's definitely worth learning because you, you, you know, despite what everybody says about it, you know, you put 20 Elliott Wave people in the same room and they all come out with 20 different opinions, whatever. Just learning it and applying it, it kind of does something to your mind. You'll start thinking more in terms of market structure and waves which is always a good thing. Even if you're counting it wrong, you know, don't try to don't try to stick to it so much that you fall in love with your own analysis and you start making bad decisions based on faulty analysis. Just kind of do it, get comfortable with it, 
if you see a perfect setup in the market geometry that contradicts your wave count, go with the setup in the market geometry over your wave count. Always do that, okay? So always go with your market geometry over your Elliott Wave analysis, and you'll tend to do better with it. But just having the Elliott Wave as a, as a tool kind of helps you understand market geometry within a context <coughs> and the Fibonacci stuff within a context because the fibs are used in conjunction with Elliott Wave. That's where we get Fibonacci from, Ralph Nelson Elliott. He's the one that started applying fibs to the market. And it's in the context of the Elliott Wave principle. Okay, so you don't want to dissociate those two. You don't want to just use fibs but not have an understanding of wave structure and market structure, okay? So you want to learn this as difficult as it may be. It's really not, I wouldn't call it difficult. I would just say maybe a little bit confusing at first, slightly convoluted with all the nuances, uh, but you, you will get the hang of it. Okay, and typically there's going to be relationships between these waves. So I don't want to spend too much time on the motive waves, but more often than not, your fifth wave will equal the same size and scope as the first wave, all right? The fifth wave is either going to be 61.8 of the first wave, if the first wave is extended. If it's, you know, if you have a really big first wave, your fifth wave will tend to be 61.8 of that. If you have a smaller first wave, the fifth wave will tend to be 138.2 of that. Sometimes 161.8, but more, more often 138.2. Okay, I did a course with the guys at ElliottWave.com, uh, kind of a private course. They had, I think there were 20 of us there, and they went through and they did all the probabilities of all these different relationships for all the different corrective waves and motive waves and stuff like that. And um, if I'm quoting it correctly, we'll go over that probably in the third part to this because we're going to do this several times to make sure you guys understand it well. Um, there are higher probability relationships between the waves. So more often than not, you'll see wave 5 equal wave 1 and then either 61.8 or 138.2 of the size of wave one. And then waves one through three, you run a fib extension of those and then bring it back to wave four and you'll typically run 61.8 of waves one through three for the end of wave five. Now if waves one through three are really huge and long then you'll tend to come to 38.2, which is where we're at right now. So this is really the zone for this set of waves, if I'm counting them correctly. This is really the zone for the reversal right here. Everybody with me so far? And yeah, Steph, Stefan is saying something inter interesting here. So very often alternate counts. So I could count this a different way. I could say this would be wave three here. And then four. All right, then my areas would change slightly, but we would still have you know, the same type of analysis per what's the future direction, okay? So oftentimes your alternate counts will still lead to um, something of similar scope coming to fruition uh, in the near future, but not always, okay? Sometimes you can have very widely differing alternate counts. But at any, any rate, for this section, this is counting like a perfect impulsive wave up. Okay, I'm counting this as wave four being an expanded flat. Now for the expanded flat, let me delete these. For the expanded flat, you'll typically have 
for wave A, B, C. Let me take one more picture of this. Okay. All right. So now then, as we zoom in on wave four here, you will typically see for an expanded flat that wave B will come back to one, two, seven, two. And this is really the only time that I use the one, two, seven, two. All right the expansion of wave A. So I'm using the retracement tool, which gives me over here the 38.2, the 50, the 61.8, the 78.6 within this wave A, and then the expansion, 1272, 1618, and negative 272, negative 618. So wave B will usually come up to 27.2 uh, expansion above the starting point, or 38.2. Okay, sometimes it'll come as high as the 61.8. Occasionally 200, but that's kind of rare. So if I had more, you know, areas here to, to add this, I would also have my 138.2. But typically I just have the 1272, and then I know the 138.2 is very close by. All right, now the wave C will also come a uh, 27.2% expansion of wave A. And that's, you know, the guys at ElliottWave.com figured all this out over, I think they had it over 10,000 patterns, 10,000 examples of each pattern, something like that. So they claimed, but they've got a lot of people working for them, so. All right, so that's your typical, and let me draw this out so it's, clear when you're reading these charts. Right, let me just delete. I'll leave that one, I guess. I'll delete this one, this one, and this one. Okay. So here, Actually, let me do this. I'm going to take a snapshot of this first, and then we'll draw on it using Snagit. So here, you can just do this expanded flat correction. four. B wave will typically expand 27.2% of, let's say above, a wave. Okay. Let's do this twenty seven point two to one six one right here. Sorry, sixty one point eight percent above wave A. And oftentimes it'll nail exactly the 38.2. And I'll highlight these over here. And then highlight this negative 272. <clears throat> okay. So then your C wave will do the same.
Whoops, not what I meant to do. Got it? So that's your typical expanded flat. Any questions about any of that? Quick question from Stefan. Does the C wave expand B by 272? Or is the 1272 of A an offset to the top of the third wave? No. Okay, there's another relationship as well. I just haven't gotten into that yet. So it's of wave A expanded above 272 and then below 272. So the expansion, which is a part of the retracement tool, this tool right here, okay, for the extension using the size of wave A and then bringing that back to wave B, that's an extension. This will typically be 161.8, 138.2 to 161.8, sometimes 200%. Okay, I'm going to put this together in a document. So. So then we have the expansion, which is this button right here. What is going on with this thing? Okay, from the starting point to the end of wave A, and then back to wave B. You see? You see how it comes 161.8? That's your typical, which is why I think this is an expanded flat. I mean, you can just tell by looking at it after you do this a, a long time. You don't really necessarily need to have the fibs. Well, that's pretty obvious, right? So that's why I'm thinking this is your uh, expanded flat. It's perfect. Maybe I should make this a little bigger. say 14 for now. Is that better? Let me get rid of these. Yeah, it's better. So there's your B wave, there's your C wave, this is the fourth wave expanded flat correction, and then the C wave will also be extend 138.2. To 161.8 percent, sometimes 200 percent. Let's say the length of a wave projected from end of B wave. Does that make sense? because this is an extension. That's why the 161.8, we're using the size of the A wave, bringing it back to the end of B, 161.8%, the end of C, oftentimes this negative 272 or negative 38.2 will 
uh, make a confluence zone with the 161.8 for the end of wave four. And then it all comes together with a market geometry area, a trend line or a channel line or a median line. Yeah, you would prefer to see a trend bar, which I'm sure you do here on the five minute. We'll go back and look at that. But yeah, you'd like to see, you know, a climax into it, a bunch of volume come in, and then a bunch of volume take it out. It doesn't always have to have a bunch of volume take it out, but you'll typically see the buying coming in at that low and stopping it there. Ken is asking, uh, overnight last night seemed to be impulsive on the ES. Which chart do you use for the basic count? Typically the 20 minute. Uh, Prechter will say that Robert Prechter, the guy that rewrote the book on Elliott Wave, or wrote a more, you know, he kind of made Elliott Wave what it is, him and uh, I think Frost, Robert Frost. Um, he would say don't count on anything smaller than a 15 minute chart. Okay. But the way that we're doing it, you know, we're also kind of quote unquote counting on the one minute chart. We're not really using the same exact rules that they might use. CL is looking like it's made a high there. Oh, it hit, did it hit, uh, 12? It hit 40.08. Hmm. That might be the end of it. I think it, it would look better if it came up a little bit higher. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, 15 minute chart and then the larger tick chart. Because the larger tick chart, you know, sometimes the overnight action can be just kind of sideways and, excuse me, long and drawn out. That tick chart will eliminate that, and you can kind of get a little bit better look to the waves. But you also want to look at the RTH chart, which eliminates the overnight altogether. Okay, so that's where you get conflict between the ETH, the extended trading hours, the full 24 hour session and the RTH chart, which are the regular trading hours, the, the pit session. Well, anyway, the 930 to 415 session. Looks like Tim shorted. Yeah, it's more of a rounded look on that three minute on the make on, on the uh, April contract. Doesn't quite make it to the top of the trend line on the three minute. Let me show you what I mean real quick as we take a, a moment to go over crude since it is looking like a top here. See, it doesn't quite make it back to the trend line, that same trend line that you have, doesn't quite make it back to it here. You have a lot stronger divergence, it looks like. Unless you're drawing it from a different wave. Are you drawing it from a different wave? No, I don't think you could be. No, that would be an overthrow there. So yeah, that could be it. So from this low, you have a nice A, B, or I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five. Hmm, and now it's reversing. Isn't that interesting? So there is use to Elliott Wave and just wave analysis in general. There's, I think there are four or five different types of wave analysis. Uh, things like the Wolf Wave aren't exactly all-encompassing market structure. You're just looking for a couple of particular patterns uh, and variations thereof. But you have something called... Um, Oh, what's it called? The a Anderson wave or something? Uh, I can't remember. There's a couple of good ones out there that are worth reading, but they get into like 13 waves and 
17 waves, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I think the Elliott wave makes much more sense because they're tying it into market psychology, herd, herd mentality and stuff like that. So it makes a lot of sense when you read uh, the book on Elliott wave and, and look at all the, the examples, all the charts. It's interesting stuff. It's useful. And the way that we're using it tied into market geometry is, uh, is definitely useful, but you can get yourself into trouble. So you've got to be careful. So this was one of the corrections that we traded today. So we've got five waves up here. Let's look at that on the one minute. And look at that correction. Oh, where are we? And I'll post this in the room as well. I have to go in about eight minutes. I have a, I gotta do a Bloodhound template. My favorite thing in the world to do. Here you have five waves up. We missed the buy here. So I was waiting for the retracement. So we get, and this is really even better because it's a clear um, five up now. So you could count this as the third wave and this is the fourth. You could count it either way. It doesn't really matter that much on a one minute chart, obviously. You've got one, two, three, four, five. You could count this as your A. Expanded flat B, but that would make this like 261.8, which is kind of a rarity. So that's what that's what I mean about the one minute chart. You don't really well, it's 200%. So we can that's still valid. All right, we could count that as an expanded flat. All right, but that's what I mean about the one minute chart. You don't want to, you know, say, oh well, wave four came back inside of wave one, so that can't be wave four. It doesn't quite work like that on the one minute chart. Okay, so as it came down here, yes, we get the relationship and yes, it retraced for let's call this wave two. It retraced 50% to the tick. Okay, but what really gave us the trade is yes, you've got, you know, five waves up, three down, you've got a correction. But what confirms all of that for us is the market geometry. You've got the median line intersecting the auto line right there. And then that's where I got in. It went against me one tick right here. And then went up and then I got out after it broke that high a little early since I'm only trading one contract now. We'll leave that 200 there and that 50. Okay, you're not always going to get a perfect fib confluence, uh, but oftentimes you will, and the fibs will intersect the area in the market geometry right, right where the market comes down to. And that's really what you want to see. I'm going to make a, uh, a document that shows uh, as many examples as I can find of that actually happening where. Wave three will go up and hit the 161.8 of wave one, right where uh, that fib intersects the trend channel line. So again, this is just a tool, one of many that we use, but it's really the combination of all the tools that gives it the, the kind of synergy that that. Uh, that you need from the trading system to be able to be profitable, to be able to make money. So without some of these discretionary methods, it's pretty hard to make money with mechanical rules. You know, you, you have to really understand the way the markets work. You have to understand volume, and how it comes in at particular areas, how to define those areas, how to protect your trade, you know, how to protect that stop. 
You always want that stop behind an area where the where the market is likely to bounce. That's where the profile can come in handy sometimes. Is you know protecting that stop behind a little area where you had some volume come in and where hopefully more volume would come in if the market came to that area once again. Um, things of that nature. So there's there's really a lot to trading. I hear people you know use this kiss method. Kiss kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Well, it sounds nice. It sounds great. And it would be nice to have a really simple system, but I've never seen a simple system make money. I've tested quite literally thousands of them, but I've never seen any of them make money consistently. Yeah, you might, you know, have a couple of good winning weeks here and there, but at the end of the year, which is really what it's all about, where are you at at the end of the year? Here, we're going to be up, I guarantee you. I know that for a fact. But there's ups and downs. I mean, there always is in any trading system. So if by the end of the year you're down and you're using a mechanical system, it's, uh, you know, it's time to hang it up and, and find something that actually is useful. So, and of course we're drawing these areas in from all the major swings. So as this trade was coming, as we were getting down to that area, I had both of these areas drawn. So I didn't know, well, should I use this swing high or this swing high? Well, let's use both of them. Okay, it came through this one. So then I said, well, okay, forget about that one. And then it came right to where the median line intersects this auto line from that swing high. And had I have left this uh, trend channel line, which, you know, this is the baseline of the trend channel. You can see that lower medium line came right to it, to the tick right here. Let's clean this up a little bit. You see that medium line? But anyway, we don't really need that on there. So that's the area right there. So let's just say five up. Three down, two in the area. And then pull the trigger. Right? Sorry guys, I want to continue this more. I guess we'll uh, we'll do this more tomorrow, and then we'll start including the reversal patterns. This is really going to take several several hours to teach, so we may just do this um, every day for an hour next week until we go over enough examples that you guys start to see this stuff without having to think about it too much. Yeah, months, yeah. Well, you know, it ain't easy. That's for sure. But it is, uh, it's just kind of the way the market works. I mean, it does move in threes and fives, you know. You don't have to be brilliant to see that. And, you know, you may not like Elliott Wave. You may have heard a lot of negative stuff about it or been burned by people trying to count and then you get all turned around and messed up. But, it's definitely useful. I mean, you'll, you'll see me take a lot of good trades based on wave counts. Okay. So, yeah, my brain's slower than it used to be, too, I guess. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not. It feels like it sometimes. You're welcome, Harold. Yeah, I want to do this more and more for you guys. I know... Um, you're anxious to learn this through and through, and uh, I'm anxious to teach it to you because it's going to help you. I know it. I know it is. And I want to see you guys do good and you know come out the other end making money. So that's what this is all about. I'm not trying to uh, blow smoke. You know, it's it's real. I'm not some kind of used car salesman or something, so. 
It's just going to get better and better and better. So, and I think I'll get better at teaching as time goes by. I think that's kind of been an issue for me. I'm not really a teacher per se, but I am fast becoming one. All right, so we're going to end it there. I got to go. This guy's calling me. Um, yep, I'm going to have Constantine edit it. Or I have to split it up and then I'll send it to him to render it and I'll get it up as quickly as possible. And I'm taking tonight off and uh, busting some stuff out. I've been doing these classes, but I'm not going tonight. So I got to get some work done. So I'll get it out as quickly as possible and I'll talk to you guys in the morning. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.